Hello, welcome to Archival Adventures. I hope that you're having a lovely week uh, and you're probably about halfway through it the way we are here. Uh, it is currently Wednesday afternoon here in Blacksburg on the campus of Virginia Tech. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, your Community Collections Archivist here, and this is the show where we pick something in the archives and we explore it. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, I do want to say welcome um, to Hannah and Lord Portico and Elixi. I see all of you in chat already. Um, in case you're not aware, I have, uh, the stream goes out to two channels. It goes out to the VTUL Studios channel, which is um, short for Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios. So it goes over to that channel and it goes out to my personal Twitch channel, Rogan27. Um, and those chats are respectively there and there. So I'm able to um, see what you all are saying uh, shortly after you type it. Um, but I often have to look to the side because I don't currently have any monitors directly in front of me to monitor chat. So uh, there will be a lot of the side of my head probably. Um, but <laughs> that's all technology stuff. Um, Thank you, uh, thank you, Portico, for dropping a shout out for the VTUL Studios channel in in the chat there. Um, so, how about we start uh, the way that we start every stream, which is by reading the Virginia Tech Land and Labor Acknowledgement. Um, and I have a setup for that. There. See, um, all right, so <laughs> I am well prepared. Uh, I think it's important that we take a look at this um, regularly. And so we start every stream by looking at it. This is the commitment that Virginia Tech has put out uh, regarding indigenous communities and um, people of color. So Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland. We recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So it is my hope that on this stream, we're able to um, bring forward collections that we have uh, that are relevant to indigenous peoples' communities, as well as um, uh, reflective of people of color, um, not every collection is going to have that, but I do make an effort to um, make sure that we can share those resources. Uh, and yeah, that is the commitment as stated by Virginia Tech. And um, I leave it up to you as to whether that commitment is being met. Um. <laughs> Elixir, you're doing fine. Um, thank you for uh, being there, uh, VTUL Kira, to, to drop that in the chat. Um, the other thing, before we jump into documents, uh, this week we don't have a single finding aid because it's an assortment of items. Uh, the theme this week is prohibition and temperance, um, and we're going to look at those, and uh, basically it's going to be some stuff about what ultimately led to the passage of the constitutional amendment that banned alcohol, as well as um, preparations for prohibition going into effect, 
uh, possibly some things during Prohibition. I don't know if there's anything in, in the collection that, or, or in what I have that is um, regarding the end of Prohibition uh, and the, the passage of another constitutional amendment to um, re-allow <laughs> uh, consumption of alcohol, uh, but we'll find out. Also, off the top of my head, I cannot remember which amendments they are. Um, so, but uh, this is a listing um, that is available from the um, the Finding Aid command. There is a link there, and you have view access to see this. Uh, so you're free to peruse this and let me know if there's something in particular that you want me to get to on stream. There's probably more here than we will get to otherwise. Uh, but I will just go through the titles. We have um, Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform Flyers. Uh, we have a collection of Southern Wine and Liquor Company Ephemera, um, which I know that one does include specific stuff about, hey, Prohibition's about to take effect. Uh, I, I don't know what it says, but I know it's there. Um, Anti-Prohibition Manual, a summary of facts and figures dealing with Prohibition. The two banner Prohibition states being a careful review of condi conditions in Maine and Kansas under Prohibition legislation. Uh, the Women's Temperance Movement. The Devil's Orchard. Earl Palmer Appalachian phot Photograph and Artifact Collection. Um, I know in here in among these, uh, there are some moonshiners and uh, pictures of stills. Technically, we also in this collection have a moonshine still, but it's not on site and I didn't have it uh, moved here from across campus uh, in order to awkwardly try to show it under the camera that I have here. It would be too big for the camera. Uh, so uh, we, we have photos of it though. Uh, the Thomas W. Colley collection, um, which includes a folder of temperance sermons and materials, the U.S. Bureau of Internal Revenue distillery forms, uh, Ivanhoe, Virginia, moonshine still, glass plate, Stimmel Distilling Company form, uh, Virginia Brewing Company letter, Old Kentucky Distillery Warehouse receipt, Women's, sorry, Women's Christian Temperance Union of Virginia Collection, and a book called The Temperance Tales. And then um, there is one folder from the records of the office of the president, Ver Julian A. Burris, uh, one of the presidents of Virginia Tech. Um, there is one folder that has a letter from the National Women's Christian Temperance Union. So these are the items that I have pulled that are on the cart. If there's something in particular there that you do want to see, do let me know. Um, and I will make sure to get it on stream for you. Uh, but let me go ahead and switch so that we can start taking a look at some documents. 18th and 21st Amendments. Thank you, uh, Lord Portico. Yeah, I didn't remember off the top of my head. I sort of thought that you would know. Um, I just wasn't able to see chat because the computer that I look at chat on uh, for that channel is the one that was um, sharing its screen so that I could show you those things. Uh, we're not moving the still for the third time in two years. Indeed, indeed. Um, it, it's rather bulky and awkward to move. So, well, where do I want to start? Uh, I don't see any requests in chat yet. I think I'll start over here with some of these, some of these smaller documents. Um, oh, actually, I have more than is on that list um, because when I went to pull the things that are on that list, and I totally forgot about this, or they, these would all be on the list. Uh, when I went to pull things for that list, um, 
next to those, some of those items on the shelf were additional items that were relevant that I had not turned up initially in a catalog search. And so I pulled them as well. In anticipation of 1920s documents. Uh, yeah. Um, there is the potential for some historical terms. Um, so I'm just gonna, we're gonna glance at the first item here, uh, which is the Lane County Temperance Directory, re revised 1941. Um, so refresh my memory on when the 18th Amendment passed and when the 21st Amendment passed. Uh, because I feel like 41 is after the end of Prohibition, but that could just be me not really knowing when the 21st Amendment passed. Uh, so revised 1941, by dry, say why. Um, I can actually zoom in on this. Uh, we have this wonderful camera now that does the zooming very, very nicely. Um, There, that's much better. And I'm gonna grab a weight uh, so I don't have to sit there and hold it the whole time. 18th was ratified in 1919, uh, and the 21st would have been 1933. So yeah, 41 is after. Uh, effective 1920 at the national level. Uh, state level prohibition, yeah, that's a whole different story, state level. Um, and indeed, we still have some states in the United States still have blue laws left over um, that restrict when alcohol can be purchased, uh, such as I know um, Virginia and Minnesota both don't allow the purchase of alcohol on Sundays. Um, and I know, I don't know if it's still the case, but I know Virginia used to not allow the purchase of alcohol after midnight uh, except in a bar, um, but you couldn't like buy beer at the grocery store after midnight uh, until I don't know what time of the morning they allowed the sale again, uh, but I know that used to be a thing. <laughs> you trust the food history archiving expert? Uh, yeah, Elixir, um in chat here is is very knowledgeable about this topic. Uh, so let's see. Ye are our epistles writ... Yeah, okay. So this is, this is from uh, the Christian Bible. Ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 2. Uh, and then each of us, by the deeds we do, the thing we say and the places we go, are writing a volume of action for the world to read. Lane County Temperance Directory. Uh, apparently this is from Oregon. I was like, Lane County where? I didn't know which state, but this is Oregon. Uh, names collected and compiled by Mrs. Laura Trashel. Eugene, Oregon. Mississippi didn't allow the purchase of alcohol on Sunday until afternoon. Uh, at least they didn't when you lived there over 10 years ago. Would you, you would tip your Prohibition era hat, but you're not wearing one. How shocking, a woman not in a hat? Uh, yes, Prohibition era women would have been expected to be wearing a hat. Um, now, one thing I did not pull, that I totally could have pulled for this, uh, is like the old issues of the Ladies Home Journal, and we could have poured through them looking for Prohibition era stuff because I know it would have been in there, and it would have been interesting, but there was plenty of other stuff, and um, flipping through a, a magazine to try and find an, a relevant article would have eaten up a bunch of time. So let's see. Um, the reason groceries were stressed is because children are more apt to frequent these places alone than other places of business. 
In this revision, some names were copied from the 1938 edition where the management was believed the same. If any errors occur, please consider that the author is a, a disabled shut-in, uh, obliged to depend entirely on the phone or writing for the survey. When patronizing these dealers, please tell them why. Uh, they have cooperated by listing their names and deserve recognition for doing so. If parents and leaders will use this booklet in setting an example before the younger group who are looking for them for, to them for guidance, the author will feel amply repaid for her efforts. In the master's name, LT, what a sign-off that is. Um, and you'll note, if you were reading along, that uh, I did adjust. There was a term printed in here um, uh, that is a derogatory term, so I, I adjusted as I read. Um, I, so far, this is supposed to be a directory. Um, we're a couple pages in and no directory yet. Uh, what do they see in you? Has someone seen Christ in you today? Apparently this is a very religious uh, directory. Christian, look to your life, I pray. The little things you do and say, do they accord with the way you pray? Uh, there are aching hearts and blighted souls being lost in sin's destructive shoals, and perhaps of Christ their only vow uh, may be what they see of him in you. I think view, not vow. Uh, the world with a criticizing view has watched. Did you see Christ in, did it see Christ in you? Author unknown. I, I'm not gonna read all the poetry. Apparently I did read all the poetry. Uh, but here, we finally have a directory. Uh, <clears throat> anything with an asterisk, apparently, uh, they were not contacted for this edition, um, and they appeared in the 1938 directory. Uh, and so there is a listing of bakeries and confectionaries, dairy and creamery, drugstores. So these are somehow, I don't, I don't really understand how these are affiliated with the temperance movement, other than whoever ran these businesses agreed to be listed in this directory, which I assume meant that they in some way supported the temperance movement. Um, but like, I don't know what in practice that would have meant uh, as far as a business gas stations, grocery and produce. Uh, so yeah, it's just a, it's a directory of businesses in uh, Eugene, Oregon, it looks like. Meat markets, specifically in Lilano County, uh, or Yano County, I don't know exactly how that county is pronounced. Restaurants. Places that don't sell booze. Yeah, that is my assumption as well. Yeah, it's sort of like an anti-boycott list. That, um, and then organizations approving this project? I guess these are not businesses that would even possibly sell alcohol, so these are places that have signed on to say, yes, this is a great project, uh, even though they are not, like, we're not gonna sell alcohol because they wouldn't be expected to sell alcohol anyway. Uh, this one I think is more interesting to me. These are the, the organizations that said, yes, we are part of this movement. Alpha Circle, Baptists Young People's Union, Bethel Community Club, Central Lutheran Ladies' Aid of Eugene, Christian Church Ladies' Aid, Church of the Brethren, uh, City Federation of Women's Organizations, City Missionary Union, Croswell Civic Club, City Ministerial Association, Church of God Missionary of Southern Eugene, 
Apparently, Eugene is big enough to have a southern Eugene uh, listing. I don't actually know how how large Eugene, Oregon is. Um, I definitely don't know how big it was in 1941. Elmira Missionary Society. Every man's Bible class. <laughs> e Evangelical Church Missionary S Society, I'm guessing, of Eugene. Home Economics Club. I'm a royal circle. I'm uncertain how that is meant to be pronounced. R-U-Y-L-E. Iota Sigma, Lane County Christian Endeavor, Ladies Aid, Lone Pine Welfare Workers. Um, their typewriter needs a new E. Uh, all the E's look like O's. Uh, Lane County Federated Women's Organization, or Federation of Women's Organizations. Uh, Military Mothers Service Club, Mount Home Community Club, New League, Presbyterian Missionary Union, Salvation Army, South Methodist Church, Thursday Club, uh, Victory Circle, WCTU, oh, Women's Christian Temperance Union, Central, uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union of Eugene, I think, yeah, uh, East Eugene, Lane County, Springfield, Westside, Cottage Grove, Women's Union, Methodist Church, Young Matrons, M.E. Miss So, Missionary Society, but I don't know what M.E. Young Matrons, M.E. Missionary Society. I don't know what the M.E. stands for there. Uh, as of 2020, Eugene, Oregon had a population of 180,748. So not tiny. And then there's a listing of individual citizens commending this project. Oh, wow. These are people who wanted to be seen uh, as anti-alcohol. And they wanted to be in this booklet so that the rest of the anti-alcohol people would know that they were anti-alcohol. Uh, the Liquorites Boast. Uh, this is the final poem in, in this item. I care not for your prayers, nor your strongest vows, as long as to action they do not arouse. I just laugh at your prayers and the vows you make, as long as their claims you continue to break. For all your strongest vows, with no binding effect, will do me no harm because of your neglect. Selected? <laughs> I don't understand the byline of selected. Um, that is a new one on me. Youth is watching and following you. Where are you leading? That was the Lane County Temperance Directory, revised 1941, uh, from Eugene, Oregon. Interesting. Let's see what else we got here. Oh, I like this one. Um, the advantages and disadvantages of drunkenness. Uh, let me be very clear, before we start looking at this, I am in no way suggesting that you should go out and get drunk. I'm not personally anti-alcohol. I don't tend to drink a lot of it myself. Um, what I would say I'm against is binge drinking. And if you have problems in that area, um, I would ask that you please reach out for assistance. Uh, if you happen to be here at Virginia Tech, there's the um, Virginia Tech Recovery Society that could be of assistance. I don't know if the new, um, I suppose I should have looked this up. 
Uh, the new national service here in the U.S. I don't know if they there's a mental health um, hotline. We're gonna find out. So there is, there is one specifically in the U.S. Uh, for substance abuse and mental health services, and that is 800-662-HELP, which is 800-662-4357. Um, but I suspect that also if you reached out to 988, they could get you connected to the right place. Uh, as for other countries, I don't have a full listing there, but before we dove into drunkenness, I thought it would be good to just mention that. Um, the advantages and disadvantages of drunkenness, containing a variety of plain and important maxims, well worthy of being remembered by every man in the nation, uh, printed for the trustees of the publishing fund by Hilliard and Metcalf Cam in Cambridge, sold by Cummings and Hilliard, number one Cornhill, Boston, and other agents of the publishing fund, December 1821. Um, <clears throat> so 1821, uh, by every man in the nation, man very possibly could have referred to only men in 1821, but also in 1821, the possibility that they mean just human beings and are using the word man to refer to people. Um, we've talked about that language and how it has shifted over time uh, to where the male was not the gender neutral if you go far enough back, but then it became the gender neutral in English. Um, all books advertised on the covers of tracts printed for the trustees of the publishing fund have been examined and are recommended by the publishing committee. Um, there's a note in here. Um, I'm guessing it's a dealer's note. Some of our books, if they were purchased at auction or from dealers, will have a note. So let's see what the dealer has to say. Uh, yeah, so this came from, let's see, I'm going to take that off screen because address and phone number, although technically, I mean, I guess, free advertising for them. <laughs> if it was the R couple document, I wouldn't want it there, but it's the dealers, and that's their business address, so I'm fine with it. Uh, between the covers, Rare Books, Inc., uh, apparently that's who we got this from. The advantages and disadvantages of drunkenness. Uh, first American edition. Uh, 12 pages, stitched, printed, buff wrappers. Bit of staining, but a nice and sound, very good or better copy. What is the 12 MO? My brain is not, not parsing that one properly. Like I know the double P is pages. What is the MO? It's been a while since I wrote that type of description, but also Sometimes I just can't call information to mind and I have to look it up. Let's see. The disadvantages, or the, the advantages and disadvantages of drunkenness stated in maxims worth remembering. If you wish, sorry, I just hit the microphone and I apologize. If you wish to be always thirsty, be a drunkard. For the oftener and more you drink, the oftener and more thirsty you will be. If you seek to prevent your friends raising you in the world to, to be a drunkard, for that will defeat all their efforts. Oh, if you seek to prevent your friends raising you in the world 
be a drunkard, for that will defeat all their efforts. Uh, I guess raising you in the world is like helping you get ahead or like just helping you to better your situation. Um, let's see, if you would effectually counteract your own attempts to do well, be a drunkard and you will not be disappointed. If you wish to repel the endeavors of the whole human race to raise you to character, credit, and prosperity, be a drunkard and you will most assuredly triumph. If you are determined to be poor, be a drunkard and you will soon be ragged and penniless. If you would wish to starve your family, be a drunkard, for that will consume the means of their support. Uh, and it goes on. There are 12 pages of this. I'm not gonna, uh, well, okay, so there's not. There's only, um, so that's, I'll count that as a half page. One, two, three, or, nope, two, Roughly two and three quarters pages of those maxims. You feel like the title Advantages and Disadvantages of Drunkenness was designed to lure people in. Yeah, like, so far I have not seen them list an advantage. Except they're all phrased as advantages. It's like, hey, if you want to do this, then drunkenness is your way to go. Um... Except all of those, if you want to do this, things are considered to be negatives. So, like, if you want to be thirsty all the time, this is how you do it. If you want to become a fool, if you want to be imposed on by knaves. Uh, oh, gosh. I have not thought about what the definition of knave is in a long time. Um, a dishonest or unscrupulous person. Uh, so if you want to be imposed on by knaves, uh, be a drunkard for that will make their task easy. If you would, if you wish, would wish to be robbed, if you would wish to blunt your senses, if you, oh gosh, but ooh, that one's problematic. <clears throat> Repelling the endeavors of the whole human race sounds like it has potential on some days. Yeah, and, and here's the thing. So this is an item from 1821. And again, I'm going to say, if you are someone who is dealing with some issues and you need assistance, um, in the US, you can call 988 and they'll get you some assistance. Uh, if you need somewhere to contact and you're not in the US, please reach out to the mods and uh, we'll find you a number to call. Because um, the advice given here, which is clearly intended because this is all written uh, and intended to be, these are bad things, you shouldn't want these. Um, if you would wish to blunt your senses, be a drunkard, and you will soon be more stupid than an ass. Um, the problem is that we know that part of the mental illness associated with alcoholism, or the mental illness that is alcoholism, um, is often exacerbated by people who are dealing with very strong emotions and want to blunt their senses. Uh, they want to make those emotions more dull. Uh, so mm, that one struck me as, as a little problematic there. But uh, I mean, they're all problematic. This is a book from 1821. Uh, if you would become a fool, if you wish to unfit yourself for rational intercourse, intercourse in 1821, in this context, would mean uh, discussion. Uh, if you are resolved to kill your, oh gosh, um, yeah. Again, I'm just gonna throw out there, mental health services exist, and if you need help, uh, please reach out. If you would expose both your folly and secrets, if you think you are too strong, 
if you would get rid of your money without knowing how. Uh, <laughs> if you suddenly want your money to go away and you don't want to know where it went. Uh, let's see, if you would have no resource when past labor but a workhouse. Uh, oh, I guess that's basically saying if, if you would like to not have a house except for the workers' bunkhouse, we gotcha. Uh, if you're determined to expel all comfort from your house, if you would be always under strong suspicion, um, if you would be reduced to the necessity of shunning your creditors, if you would be a dead weight on the community and cumber the ground if you would be a nuisance if you would be hated by your family and friends if you would be a pest to society if you do not wish to have your faults reformed continue to be a drunkard and you will not care for good advice if you would smash windows break the peace get your bones broken tumble under carts and horses and be locked up in watch houses be a drunkard, and it will be strange if you do not succeed. If you wish all your prospects in life to be clouded. If you would destroy your body. If you mean to ruin your soul. And finally, if you are determined to be utterly destroyed in a state body and soul, be a drunkard and you will soon know that it is impossible to adopt a more effectual means to accomplish your end. Wow. Uh, thank you, Portico. Yes, as we review unedited historical documents, we may encounter words and phrases or content that are derogatory, harmful, or wildly inaccurate, either now and or in their historical context. Please feel free to step away, as desired, for your own safety and well-being. <laughs> you do like magic tricks where money disappears? <laughs> yeah. Wow. And then there's a passage that's attributed to Lord Bacon, uh, followed by a passage that appears to be adding context around Christian Bible verses, and then a poem. Interesting. So, yeah, the advantages here were theoretical. Or false advertising, let's say. <laughs> Magic tricks where money disappears. You call that online shopping. Let's have the truth about prohibition. Well, clearly, this is going to be fully accurate and tell us only the truth. It's published, and it looks so official in this sort of, like, 1930s handbook design. It's got to be 100% accurate, right? Let's have the truth about Prohibition by Gordon Best, revised edition 1932, price 25 cents, copyright 1931, American Businessmen's Prohibition Foundation, printed in USA. Uh, it does look like we might have another, um, no, oh wow. This book has, uh, postage paid reply envelope so that you can send back a check to subscribe. Uh, so this would be, so uh, original copyright 1931, uh, revised edition 1932, so just before the passage of the 21st Amendment. <laughs> 
$400 is a lot of money for then. 1932, $400? That's the Great Depression. $400, you were rich. Uh, good audiences always like, comment, and subscribe. That's at least $4,500 now. Wow. Um, all right. This booklet was prepared for the foundation after months of painstaking research through the cooperation of entirely unprejudiced experts on nat of national reputation in accordance with our one basic instruction. Get and compile the facts from authentic records only. This book is their answer. So this is the fourth edition, uh, revised 1932. Let's have the truth about prohibition. Simple subjects often assume the aspect of being extremely complex when propaganda and argument step in to cloud the real issue. That is exactly the situation with reference to national prohibition. In the maze of arguments growing around it, many people have lost the real why of prohibition. It will help if we spend just a moment in getting down to bedrock on the subject. First of all, suppose we ask, what is national prohibition? Prohibition is so easily defined that a full and effective definition can readily be given in a single sentence. Here it is. National prohibition is a method of reducing the consumption of alcoholic beverages. Prohibition is not the only method of achieving this result, nor is it a perfect one. But what do the facts show? Since the adoption of national prohibition, 20 million more Americans have become of voting age. Many of these 20 millions never saw alcoholic beverages sold legally. It is natural, then, that they should be easily confused by so much heated propaganda. Irrespective of opinion as to the legal restraint of the liquor traffic, there is, we believe, wide agreement that intoxicating liquors are, in general, injurious to the drinker and may therefore be injurious to those with whom he comes in contact, and thus harmful to the morale and character of the nation as a whole. The... That is a sentence. That paragraph is one sentence in length. It must be the truth. It's all in caps. Oh, wow, it's closer to $9,000 for the subscription. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing because in chat, um, Elixi uh, posted... Quote, national prohibition is a method of reducing the consumption of alcoholic beverages, unquote. Uh, and followed that with, raise his hand with more of a comment than a question. Um, amazing. Amazing. Also, you're welcome to share your comments. That is what a Twitch chat is for. This is one sentence. Irrespective of opinion as to the legal res restraint of the liquor traffic, comma, there is, comma, we believe, comma, Wide agreement that intoxicating liquors are, comma, in general, comma, injurious to the drinker and may therefore be injurious to those with whom he comes in contact, comma, and thus harmful to the morale and character of the nation as a whole. There's a few qualifiers in there. Uh, wow, I'm just, uh, I'm thinking about how to diagram that sentence. You remember diagramming sentences? Uh, from from uh, grade school. <laughs> you know, I and also, and also I know, comma I believe, comma that unicorns exist. Yeah, that kind of um, qualification where it's a definitive statement. There is wide agreement with the qualifier. We believe. Meaning, they can't get in trouble for stating something false because they said, we believe. This is a method still used today. Uh, the maximum legal content of one half of 1% alcohol now in force was originally adopted by the Internal Revenue Department of the United States government in 1867. As the dividing point between so-called soft drinks and intoxicating liquor, subject to attacks as such, this defining figure for intoxicating liquor was named by the brewing industry itself. Therefore, the cry for 4% beer as a non-intoxicating beverage is not in agreement with the figure set by the brewing industry. 
Opposition to the 18th Amendment takes form in the shape of various claims, of which the following are typical. 1. The 18th Amendment is not and never has been the will of the American people. 2. The 18th Amendment was adopted without being put to popular vote. 3. The 18th Amendment is a violation of state rights. 4. National prohibition has increased lawlessness and put the bootleggers in power. 5. Prohibition has increased drinking. 6. Prohibition is corrupting and debauching young people. 7. Prohibition has increased taxes. 8. Prohibition has brought an increase in alcoholic diseases and deaths. 9. The repeal of prohibition would end unemployment. 10. Prohibition has destroyed personal liberty. <clears throat> Some of these arguments seem familiar, uh, only not about prohibition. Uh, these ten major attacks on prohibition could be increased in number, but the main points are covered here. The average person has neither the time nor facilities for investigating every assertion made within his hearing or reaching him through the printed page. Hence, it is easy for him to gather mistaken impressions. The attacks made under the ten headings just enumerated deserve careful consideration. Let us analyze point by point the wet claims listed above. The wet claims? Is that a term to refer to people who are in support of legalizing drinking? Key percentages in this discussion, 1.28% and 3.28%. Forget all of that half and 1% and 4% numbers. Okay. <clears throat> also, I'm... Wow. I glanced down and I saw the little tiny preview on, on the screen where the chat is and things looked blurry, but I think it's not actually blurry. Um, you assume wet being the opposite of dry or abstaining from, that is, that's, that's where, that's what I thought it was as well. Um, it took me a few moments to get there, but um, yeah, then the booklet goes into arguing each of those points. <clears throat> was the 18th Amendment the will of the American people? Uh, I can zoom out a tiny bit to better allow you all to see the full page. Uh, <clears throat> I'll zoom back in when we actually stop to read one of these. Was the 18th Amendment adopted without being put to a popular vote? Is the 18th Amendment a violation of states' rights? Has the national prohibition increased lawlessness and put the bootleggers in power? Um, has prohibition increased drinking? If you want me to read one of these, let me know. So you're a dry wet. Uh, dry, okay, wets were people who didn't support prohibition. Dries were people who supported temperance and prohibition movements. Yeah, I'm there with you too, Portico. I, I generally don't drink, but I support others in their right to do so. On November 18, 1918, prior to ratification of the 18th Amendment, the U.S. Congress passed the Temporary Wartime Prohibition Act, which banned the sale of alcoholic beverages having an alcohol content greater than 1.28%. In 1933, we got the Cullen-Harrison Act, which legalized beer with an alcohol content of 3.2% by weight and wine of a similarly low alcohol content. I see. So then when did they start allowing greater percentages? Because I know, like today, you can go to the store and get something that's like 9.8% alcohol by volume. Uh, like you could get a beer or like a cider or something. Um, is prohibition con corrupting and debauching young people? Has it increased taxes? Oh, a lovely graphic this. The advertisements reproduced here in greatly reduced size are typical full-page newspaper advertisements from the educational campaign of the American Businessmen's Prohibition Foundation. 
These and similar fact messages are carrying the truth about prohibition to millions of people throughout the country. Further information about the Foundation's advertising program will be found on pages 28, 29, and 30. Uh, and the titles featured are College Drinking, Let's Have the Truth, Beer Pump and Filling Station, Are the Bootleggers Running the Country, Prohibition and Taxes, Let's Have the Truth About Prohibition, Drinking Before and After Prohibition, Gangsters and Gang Profits, Old Man Alcohol, Now Is He Really So Bad? Ah, okay, ratification of the 21st Amendment overturned all. Debauching, a word that is not used often enough anymore. I agree, Hannah, it's a great word. Cullen Harrison was the first step to, to overturning prohibition. Uh, has prohibition brought an increase to alcoholic diseases and deaths? Would the repeal end unemployment? Has it destroyed personal liberty? Um, wow. Wow, wow, wowie, wow. Oh, uh, sorry, I think we have to read this section. Because I think today most people would not have this question. But apparently they felt people would in 1932. Alcohol, what is it? or what it is and what it does. There is one side of prohibition about which little is said in ordinary discussions. It is a side that simply does not permit of theory. One either knows or one does not know. And the truth is only a few are qualified by training and study to pass reliable judgment. We have in mind the very heart of the whole subject, alcohol itself. Has alcohol been wrongfully placed on the defensive all these years? Has it been maligned and outlawed through ignorance of the facts? What is its value as a food, as a supplier of energy? What is its physiological effect on the human body? Also, as you might imagine, during advertising and campaigns, wets and dries were terms that became both points of pride and insult, depending on who was using them. Yes. That, I could definitely see that happening. Uh, I, had, I had encountered dry before, but I guess I had never encountered wet used in this sort of context. Seeking the truth, we turned to those from whom truth can be reliably learned. We sought the findings of eminent scientific authorities. What did we learn? The verdict was unanimous. Alcohol, though possessing limited food value, is not a desirable food. Alcohol stimulates, thus it supplies energy. But its stimulating effect soon wears off. Then it destroys energy, and it destroys far more energy than it ever supplies. Well, that is interesting. If alcohol is not a desirable food, what then is it? Again, the authorities are in complete agreement. Alcohol is a drug, a narcotic. It belongs to the same group of narcotics as ether and chloroform. But you say ether and chloroform are anesthetics. True. And the effect of alcohol is very much the same. What happens to alcohol after it enters the body? The bloodstream takes it up rapidly. Heart action is quickened. Temporary stimulation is a natural result, but damaging reaction soon sets in. In larger quantities, alcohol actually paralyzes. Uh, which, I will note, is a term that is best avoided uh, as it tends to be used in very derogatory senses. Um, immobilizes would be a more appropriate term to avoid uh, possibly causing offense to people um, who suffer from physical disabilities. Uh, nearly everyone has seen the outward manifestations of alcohol as exhibited in others. In fact, this very familiarity has had much to do with our failure to appreciate the seriousness of the physiological reaction when the vic blah, blah, blah. 
In fact, this very familiarity has had much to do with our failure to appreciate the seriousness of the physiological reaction the victim is experiencing. If similar manifestations were noted from an unknown cause, we would send at once for a doctor. I, I find it interesting here that they characterize the person who consumes alcohol as a victim of alcohol, uh, regardless of whether they chose to ingest it intentionally. You feel like this is a very long story for chat, but you'll try to come up with the concise version of one of your favorite cocktail names, since it has direct bearing on people embracing a term that was supposed to be an insult. I would love that story, Elixie, if you, if you can find it or could figure out how to paraphrase it or share it briefly. Um, consider for a moment some of the common manifestations. Face flushed and hot, pulse accelerated, gradual loss of self-control. Um, all of this sounds like orgasm. Uh, brain dulled, speech impeded. <laughs> Sorry, I just like, the, the items that they um, list off at the beginning here all sound very, very similar to some natural biological processes associated with sexual, ro sexual procreation. So, uh, or just sexual enjoyment. Um, that was a very common practice, victimization in temperance literature. Brain dulled, speech impeded, staggering. Loss of equilibrium, nausea, vomiting, stupor, unconsciousness resembling the deep anesthesia produced by ether or chloroform. Are these the effects of wholesome food? By no means. If we partook of food which produced any such effect, we would call it poison. And that is exactly what alcohol is, a poison, a dangerous, habit-forming drug. In fact, if alcohol anesthesia lasts more than 10 to 12 hours, it is often fatal. These are scientific facts, not theories. They cannot be disputed. But there are those who believe that liquor drinking is a problem for the individual, not the state. That would be true if the effect of drinking were felt only by the drinker. But unfortunately, that is not the case. The whole community is affected, not only from the moral side, but from the economic side as well. So I'm going to pause again. Because while their overall argument is a specious argument, it is a problematic argument and would not stand up to rigorous scrutiny because we do know that it is possible for people to consume alcohol uh, socially and for some people to moderate and control their own behavior with regard to alcohol. We know that it is something that can be used recreationally very safely by large portions of the population. Therefore, what they're talking about here and their generalizations um, are like half-truths because there are people who what they are saying actually applies to. Things like uh, being a dangerous habit-forming drug, uh, that it can be fatal, um, that it does not just affect the individual, but it affects the people around the individual. All of these statements are accurate when it comes to somebody who has a substance abuse problem. Somebody who is suffering from alcoholism, uh, which is a condition that can be treated, um, uh, but that we tend to, in the United States at least, address as a crime problem more so than a problem where somebody needs assistance. Um, like, if somebody is has a problem with alcoholism, our, our societal response to it tends to be, 
if they're causing property damage, then they get in trouble. Otherwise, it's ignored. So it's a mix here as to is this accurate or not. A lot of the effects that they're saying it has on the body, yeah, they are accurate. Uh, that said, in moderation and with no intent to operate heavy machine machinery, um, recreational use is not a real problem, uh, as we've shown with many, many decades of evidence to back that up. <clears throat> okay, so circa 1924, a U.S. newspaper had a contest for people to come up with a name uh, people who dared to imbibe alcohol during this time, two different people, uh, a name for people who dared to imbibe alcohol, two different people proposed the name Scofflaw and split the prize money. Shortly thereafter, Harry's Bar in Paris, a famous joint, premiered the Scofflaw, a delightful cocktail. Awesome! Uh, Kira, would you mind sharing that also in the other chat? just uh, for any viewers or people who are viewing the VOD, because the chat is part of the VOD as well. Um, we're almost done with this segment, and then I'm actually going to close this and we'll get something else. Uh, this is a complex age, an age of motorized highways, motorized airways, motorized factories, and motorized farms. In this day of speed and progress, the mind that is dulled by alcohol anesthesia is not only a deterrent, but a menace, a menace more potent than ever before. America has led the world in 20th century economic progress. To maintain and increase that leadership, it was inevitable that she also lead the world in establishing national prohibition. So again, uh, sort of mixed here. Yes, indeed. Um, Operating heavy machinery while under the influence of alcohol, not a good idea. Uh, and, and that's essentially what that paragraph is saying. Um, this chapter has been made readable by the use of common terms. It is, however, entirely scientific. The basic pharmacological and medical fact in every statement has been approved by Arthur Dean Bevan, medical doctor former president of the American Medical Association, president-elect of the Interstate Postgraduate Medical Association of North America, head of the Department of Surgery of Rush Medical College of the University of Chicago, chief surgeon, Presbyterian Hospital, Chicago. Um, so actually, this is an excellent informational literacy uh, segment because it's not wrong. The facts that are listed here indeed are facts about the effects of alcohol on the body, uh, simple statements about like liquor drinking is a problem for the individual or is, uh, sorry, that, that it is, the effects of drinking uh, are not only felt by the drinker, um, don't operate heavy machinery while under the influence of alcohol, things like that. Uh, there, there are, it's, uh, it is hung on truth. Like it is, it is a structure of truth that then has been contextualized with a certain purpose. And so for, informational literacy education, uh, this is an excellent example of how the facts can be presented in a specific way to argue a specific point of view. Um, and yes, the facts are true, but the point of view presented is opinion. So it is presenting you with an opinion that's backed up by a lot of facts to try and convey that opinion as a fact. Uh, and being able to read something like this and recognize that that's what's being done 
um, is the goal of informational literacy education. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that is. For me, it's a cool find to, to find something that um, would serve as an excellent example for that. Oh, you had to pause one stream for buffering purposes? Yeah. Uh, it looks like it went through. So let's see. What else? Um, that seems pretty interesting. And again, if there's something that you would like to see that is on the list, uh, do let me know, because I will attempt to prioritize getting that done. I'm just thumbing through these to see what's here. There's a few addresses here, speeches. Uh, speeches are always fun, because then I get to um, I get to put on a voice and pretend to be someone. Um, oh, that's that. All right, couple of things here. We're gonna have some photographs uh, here shortly too. Um, First, I just needed some water. I've been talking quite a bit. <clears throat> so it's funny, at some point I just stopped consuming alcohol. It wasn't a conscious decision, it was just like, eh. I just didn't feel like it. And I, it's not that I'm against it either. And because this was the topic today, uh, you'll note I'm not wearing a, a, a bird pin today. My pin today is um, Chibi Grog Strongjaw holding um, a, a mug of Strongjaw Ale. Um, <laughs> which, when we do the closing, I'm sure you'll be able to see it better. But uh, okay, this first, or this, this next item is um, the address of the Pennsylvania, or yeah, address of the Pennsylvania State Temperance Society to the inhabitants of the Commonwealth. Uh, this is dated 1830. So before prohibition, and the reason prohibition and temperance are paired together is it was the people arguing for uh, temperance that really led to prohibition becoming a thing. Um, I'm, I might zoom in just to give a closer view of the document here. Fellow citizens, the association which bears your name was organized in the year 1827 for the purpose of discouraging the use of ardent spirit. To that object, and to that object solely, our efforts have been directed. With what success, the numerous temperance associations throughout the state, the houses of entertainment that have abandoned its use, and the storekeepers that have relinquished its baleful traffic can best answer. These results, so auspicious to your future welfare, demand the acknowledgement and gra of gratitude to him who has called you to temperance and to virtue, that in his mercy a way has been provided for deliverance from the thraldom of a vice which threatened to desolate and mar the fairest portions of his heritage. They call upon you to supplicate his continued blessing upon every righteous effort to do away with the use, or to do away the use of ardent spirit until intemperance, with all its kindred vices, shall be banished from the land and the voice of revelry and riot no more be heard within your borders. 
Is there a meaning to revelry that I am unaware of? Because I thought revelry was considered good. Um, synonyms, conviviality, festivity, gaiety, jollification, jollity, merriment, merrymaking, rejoicing, reveling, Whoopee! Uh, noisy partying or merrymaking? Apparently, that's a bad thing, according to this, uh, this speech. It is. The drives just didn't like fun. <laughs> Revelry was also associated with Dionysus in myth, which is both fun and implies overdoing it. This is, this is also true. Also, I, it's one of those things where uh, Christian societies, societies heavily influenced by the Christian faith, um, tended to take things that were celebrated via, like, enjoyment and personal abandon and personal freedom um, they and cast them in a negative light uh, as part of the takeover of and casting out of primitive religions or pagan religions uh, and so you end up with things like um, the worship of Dionysus, which revolved around partying and alcohol consumption and um, overindulgence with food. Uh, and in order to fight against that and impose a certain set of morals upon uh, a society that was used to having that sort of celebration, um, you get things like the commandment against gluttony. Um, and you get religious association with uh, uh, condemnation of alcohol consumption generally. Um, it, it's, so it's, I'm not an expert on um, religion, but I do know from like some of the reading that I've done uh, of sort of the targeting certain aspects of culture in order to move in and take over um, was a thing that happened. And we see the effects of that today. It's also similar with um, uh, many pre-Christian civilizations and um, communities were much more accepting of same-sex relationships or of people who took on gender roles that were generally considered to be the role for um, people who had a different sex assigned at birth. So uh, people who were assigned male at birth but took on female gender roles within the society uh, and vice versa. Um, and many societies were much more accepting of that pre the introduction of Western civilization and Western Christianity. Um, let's see. In the further prosecution of our labors, we, a we ask your aid. Our warfare is one of entire extermination, not against any of your, our fellow men, however blind or however degraded, yet still alike children of one common inheritance and heirs of the same promises. We seek not to hurl anathemas upon each one whom we may deem an enemy to this country, to his fellow men, yes, more than all, his own worst enemy, the enemy of his household and of his God, whether he be the manufacturer of ardent spirit, the farmer who supplies the materials, the vendor who deals out the seed of every vice, he who is miscalled the moderate drinker, or the more unhappy victim of their combined cupidity and example, the drunkard. These all, have our deep commiseration, 
and it is for these we would enlist your sympathies to rescue from the downward path of inevitable woe that large body of our fellow citizens still under the influence and dominion of this destructive article. Our warfare is against ardent spirit, and we openly proclaim it in every circumstance and under every name an enemy of the state. In no case the friend or servant of the people, under no circumstances, whatever needful for their... Well, under no circumstances, whatever needful for their comfort, their convenience, or the promotion of their interest. But the never-failing destroyer of the hopes and happiness of its... Uh, votaries? Sorry, I've never seen that word before. Uh, and happiness of its votaries, and an incalculable tax upon the property and the sympathies of every sober and industrious citizen, and ought therefore to be entirely banished from this commonwealth. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll stop there and we'll move on to another one, but um, interesting. Yeah, I've never seen the word votaries before, and getting a word I've never encountered before that is uh, split between two lines and hyphenated just makes it all the more difficult. See, herein lies the uh, one of your major issues with motivations of prohibition, the desire for total annihilation of alcohol. They had to know that wouldn't go well. Um, and yet... This same approach was taken with marijuana and succeeded generally um, until now today where finally um, uh, sort of moderating the, the full prohibition of marijuana in this country. Um, and I don't know specifically the uh, sort of, like, I've not seen the documents. Here, I've seen temperance documents. I've seen prohibition stuff. I've seen that because we have it in our collections. I haven't dug deeply into the anti-marijuana campaigns that happened around the same time. Um, I do know that I have read things which at this point, Time, I cannot recall specifically where I read them, and so I can't say for certain that they were reliable. Um, but I know that I have read things that claimed that part of the reason marijuana is illegal was because the cotton industry didn't want hemp to be a competing fiber and fought really hard uh, against marijuana because of its association with hemp. And that could entire that could be true. It could not be true. I do not know, um, and I would encourage you to inform me if you do know, or to um, seek out answers for yourself if you're curious about that. Um. <laughs> herein lies one of. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So here we have think soberly a sermon on temperance. I love this. Uh, someone has written $2 on it in pencil. I have no idea when this cost $2. Um, I also love that it's been stamped discarded. Uh, and you can see there's significant water damage. Um, and yet, I think there may have been some attempts at some, some sort of restoration work? I don't think it's restoration. I think this was possibly, yep, it was a library book. And so there's been some, uh, I'm guessing it was a circulating item at one time. And um, they've taped together the binding uh, in order to help hold it together. Um, Mr. Brooks's Sermon on Temperance. <clears throat> Let's see. Think Soberly, a sermon on temperance, delivered in the Unitarian Church, Newport, Rhode Island, Sunday evening, February 6th, 1842, by Charles T. Brooks, pastor. Uh, Newport, James Atkinson, 1842. 
Think soberly. Romans 12, 3. There are many subjects on which we are called to think soberly in these times as men, as citizens, and as Christians. But the subject upon which we are especially called, as by the very voice of God's Spirit, to think soberly, to speak soberly, and to act soberly, is the subject of sobriety itself. In another word, the temperance. I have felt it my duty as a minister and a man to take some opportunity of expressing myself in this place upon a theme always important and which at the present time is exciting such interest, not only in our own little community, but one may say without extravagance, all over the world. I know there are many who think that this is not a proper subject for the pulpit and who say that a minister of the gospel should confine himself to the preaching of the gospel. But I have read the gospel very strangely, if the great principles involved in this temperance cause are not the peculiar and essential principles of the gospel itself. I have wholly mistaken the characteristic and fundamental requisitions of the gospel, if soberness, self-denial, self-sacrifice, and humanity are not chief among them. I have a vast deal to unlearn if this is not the strongest test of our Christianity, that we watch and be sober and stand ready to sacrifice and crucify every selfish passion and every idle habit on the altar of human good. Sure, I am that the... Sure... Sorry, odd sentence structure. Probably not odd for the time, but odd for me. Sure I am that the gospel according to Paul lays great stress on the subject of temperance. When this apostle at the bidding of the Roman governor gave, when this apostle at the bidding of the Roman governor came up from his prison like an embodied I will I will successfully read this sentence, I will. <clears throat> when this apostle, at the bidding of the Roman governor, came up from his prison like an embodied conscience and spoke those words of truth and soberness which made Felix tremble on his throne, what was the subject of that preaching? He reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And one may as well say that righteousness and retribution have no intimate connection with the gospel as that temperance has not. Oh, may as well say. I skipped a word there. Uh, nor was it to the sensual and criminal Roman ruler. I was on a roll and then I, I stumbled and now I've lost it. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> nor was it to the sensual and criminal Roman ruler alone that temperance was preached. We find the apostle calling upon the Christian believers themselves, quote, let us know, or let us who, wow. Yeah, I've totally lost it now. I tried. Quote, let us who are of the day be sober. Unquote. Twice he enumerates temperance in the list of Christian virtues. He charges Titus to teach, quote, that the aged men be sober, unquote. Quote, the aged women likewise, unquote. Quote, that they may teach the young women to be sober, unquote. Quote, young men likewise exhort, he says, to be sober-minded, unquote. And finally, he admonishes all men of all classes and conditions, quote, that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, unquote. Nor again is it only the intemperate or those who are in danger of becoming intemperate that the apostle addresses on the subject. How earnestly he entreats those who feel their liberty and who are themselves strong enough, it may be, not to abuse their liberty to the enslaving of their own souls, nevertheless to consider their weaker brethren with what a Christian calmness, charity, and reasonableness he urges. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak, 
and how nobly he concludes with declaring, for his own part, strenuous as he was in his assertion of Christian liberty, If meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no meat while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Yeah, we're not going to get through the whole thing because it's many more pages. Uh, and I'm having difficulty saying the right words for some reason. Um, but yeah, another just like, if you want to be a good Christian, you need to be sober uh, argument, which is essentially the root argument of all temperance, the whole temperance movement, um, which the temperance movement is very heavily tied to the Christian church. Um, but yeah, their, their basic argument is, if you want to be a good person, you need to not drink. Uh, <clears throat> we have another one, an address delivered before the Monson Academy Temperance Society, February 12th, 1836 by S.S. Bates, Springfield, 1836. Springfield where? Is this the, is this the Springfield that the Simpsons are from? Because they never say what state that Springfield is in. And this just says Springfield. I'm guessing Massachusetts uh, because I'm guessing that uh, someone from the Northeast would assume that theirs was the only Springfield that mattered. Um, it's just interesting to me that it does not say at anywhere, as far as I can tell, what Springfield this is from. I wonder if the catalog record does. <clears throat> 1836. Association is the power, the dignity, and the happiness of man. It is through this medium that civilization and Christianization are encircling the globe and flowing to the ends of the earth. Christianization. They said the quiet part out loud there. Um, this is the sun, which is shedding the light of science into the midst of darkness, driving us under the clouds of paganism, putting to flight the erroneous dogmas of the heathen world and overturning the whole system of pagan philosophy and heathen mythology and forever putting to silence the renowned oracles of the false prophets and the subtle soothsayers. For without associations formed for that object, how would Bibles have been scattered like showers of manna upon every nation under heaven? How would missionaries by hundreds have been sent into distant lands? How would tracts like glittering fragments broken off from the great sun of truth have been found sparkling upon every shore? Many moral associations have been formed and are now in successful operation, which are pouring out their benign influence upon the nations involving the present and eternal interests of a world raising man from his fallen and degraded state and teaching him that he possesses an immortal principle, one which will survive the consummation of worlds and continue to exist when this earth shall have been wrapped in flames and disappeared, and the natural sun shall have set in everlasting night. Um. Wow, that entire first page, they don't mention temperance at all. Like, not by name, at least. They're not talking about alcohol. They're not talking about sobriety. This is an address delivered before the Monson Academy Temperance Society. So I guess this was preaching to the choir. They didn't need to talk about temperance. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I, we have found a mention of temperance on page nine. 
I think we'll jump back to here because this seems to be maybe where it starts. Lots of talk about morals before that. <laughs> Sorry, I have to I have to read this paragraph because it, it now has a song in my head. Amidst this perplexity and doubt, the wise men of the world, those who were seeking the best good of their fellow men, began to despair of ever getting rid of it. When suddenly, a light shone through the midst of darkness, dispelling the thick mists of perplexity and doubt and revealing a remedy. And what was it? Why to form associations whose motto should be, touch not. But this at first was entirely unintelligible to many. They had heard about men combining together to accomplish great undertakings, but never before had heard of great bodies of men combining together to get to let a thing alone. This was so simple that it was a mystery. And sorry, um, touch not just made me think of, please don't touch me from um, <laughs> um, young Frankenstein. Anyway. Uh, let's find out what he has to say about alcohol. Since that is pretty much the focus of temperance and prohibition. Uh, <clears throat> then you, as a society, find yourselves embarked in a most laudable, benevolent, and philanthropic enterprise. And in this enterprise, you have taken a stand worthy the cause you have espoused. Many of you have formerly belonged to a society in this institution called a temperance society, but the pledge of that society only required abstinence from distilled liquors, written in express terms, distilled liquors, while beer, wine, ale, and many liquors which contain large quantities of alcohol were left entirely out of the question, and the members were not forbidden their use by any prohibition of the pledge. Many of these members of that society began to think that this halfway work would not answer, that we were doing business too superficially, that such proceedings were not calculated to affect the object for which temperance associations are formed, and if all societies should pursue such a course, they would utterly fail of freeing the world from the evils of intemperance. We could not advocate our cause successfully. And why? Because we did not stand on firm ground. While with one hand by subscribing our pledge, we had declared eternal hostility and a war of extermination to everything which had passed through the worm of the still, with the other, we were clinging to our wine flasks and beer bottles. And what could we say to our opponent for drinking some kinds of liquor which would intoxicate while we were drinking other kinds which had the same effect? True, we had signed a pledge, but had virtually declared by that pledge that we believed it right to drink all liquors which, did not, which that did not prohibit. You were aware, also, that many associations had been formed on the plan of total abstinence from all intoxicating drinks. You believed that the interests of the cause and the spirit of the day demanded this step should be taken by all temperance societies, and that this was the only method of giving any efficient impulse to the cause, or of effecting any permanent reform. Accordingly, with these views of the subject, at the commencement of the present term, you formed yourselves into a new association and adopted a new pledge. And by signing, and in signing this pledge, you have written proscription and nullification on all that can intoxicate. This is what we call temperance, at least as far as intoxicating drinks are concerned. But what is that substance which produces intoxication? Or what are ardent spirits? Some societies express in their pledge distilled liquors and some ardent spirits. What do the members understand by the words ardent spirits? They understand that they are forbidden the use of distilled liquors and nothing more. Therefore, they may drink any kind of liquor no matter what, providing it has not been distilled. 
And this has been the definition heretofore applied to ardent spirits. It has been understood to mean distilled spirits. But an increase of light and knowledge compel, compel us, however repugnant it may be to the feelings of him who flatters himself when drinking undistilled spirits, that he is not drinking ardent spirits, but something which has the harmless name of fermented liquors. I say, an increase of light compels us to attach a new definition to the term, or rather build on an addition to the old one. For in this day of thorough investigation and deep research, it is discovered that there is but one substance in the whole vocabulary of inebriating drinks, whether distilled or fermented, which produces intoxication. And that substance is alcohol. Then, of course, we have always meant by ardent spirits... Wait, then, of course, what we have always meant by ardent spirits can be nothing more nor less than alcohol. Hence, it follows that all liquors which contain alcohol contain ardent spirits. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I have fun putting on the voice and pretending to preach. Um, that's one of the more fun voices that I can just... It's, it's not even really a voice. It's more of like a tone of, or, or a style of delivery. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun to put on. But I think these are interesting. I don't know about you all. You've, you've been really quiet, and I don't know if it's just that you're taking in and listening to the, um, the preaching. Uh, but it's kind of fun. Here we have an item um, that is very protected in here. Reasons for abolishing the liquor traffic addressed to the people of Virginia by Lucian Minor, Richmond, 1853. If this is another speech or sermon, then I'm not going to read it because uh, we want to look at some other things. But uh, I had pulled this one as well, so let's see. If I can get to page one. Yep, it does appear to be another speech. I'll zoom in. We'll take a quick gander at it, but we're not going to spend a ton of time with it, unless somebody particularly wants me to read it. Um, Abo abolition of the liquor traffic to the people of Virginia. Fellow citizens, I claim your attention upon a subject most vital, blah, 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 blah. Uh, accurate statistics leave hardly a doubt that in Virginia, the liquor traffic, through its offspring and agent, strong drink, occasions, one, 1,500 deaths every year, Two, the direct annual expenditure of $5 million. Three, the loss of as much more by bad bargains, mismanagement, time wasted, and unnumbered nameless forms of ill thrift. Four, more than 2,000 declared paupers. Sorry. So, uh, expenditure of $5 million. I'm going to try and point. Nope. Uh, I... I Anyway, the loss of at least $5 million more by bad bargains, mismanagement, time wasted, and unnumbered nameless forms of ill thrift. Uh, which I suppose translates to carelessness with money. Um, more than 2,000 declared paupers. The cost of above $100 thousand dollars in taxes annually to support these paupers a countless multitude of impover impoverished men women and children who are not avowed paupers at least four-fifths of all the murders thefts robberies breaches of the peace and other crimes and misdemeanors that engage your courts <coughs> suddenly dry. I 
Yeah, indeed. At least with this one, we know which Richmond they mean. Where the last one... I have no idea which Springfield they meant. I choose to believe it was the Springfield where the Simpsons live. <clears throat> Eight, a heavy addition to your taxes by the acknowledged legal costs of criminal prosecution besides far heavier expenses to parties, witnesses, and jurors of attending courts and of time lost from their proper employments. And nine, uh, 20,000 habitual or occasional drunkards. Yeah. But... So far we've looked at people who were against letting people drink alcohol. We do have Sorry, that was really confusing because the the um <clears throat> the information is on both sides. Uh which is atypical. Uh, we do have some materials from um, people who were not against letting people drink alcohol. I know. It's almost as if it's a surprise that such existed after we've looked at all of these things. Uh, this first one here that I'm going to pull out. You'll see... Hang on. I feel like it's not focusing properly, is it? I don't know. I think just on the smaller ones, it... doesn't look fully in focus to me. It could also be my eyes. <clears throat> a week from today, I have an eye exam. It's just an annual exam. But um, So you'll see, there's nothing written on the folder here, uh, as you may have come to expect from looking at um, other collections. Typically, the folder will have something written on it. Um, and the number on it will be MS or RG, uh, depending on what it is. This one just has a post-it note that says ACC 2019-189, and that's because um, this is an accession and has not yet been processed. Ooh, accession secrets, yeah. Um, I don't know uh, which accession this is, so this may not yet be the people in support. Yeah, no, these people are still against alcohol, but shortly we will get to ones that are not against alcohol. Uh, but we have here two flyers from the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform. Do you want to put the criminal out of business? Help the unemployed? National prohibition is the law which makes it possible for the criminal class to roll up huge fortunes while honest citizens walk the streets in search of jobs. What? Wait, these are people that are, I'm very confused. These are people who want to repeal the 18th Amendment. They're in support of letting people drink. It's the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform. And they're still talking about temperance, which is what fooled me. Yeah, prohibition reform. Okay, let me, let me uh, dive back in here. <clears throat> and national prohibition is the law which makes it possible for the criminal class to roll up huge fortunes while honest citizens walk the streets in, streets in search of jobs. 1930s. Uh, like, these are not dated, but uh, early 30s was when Prohibition was repealed. 
Uh, so people walking the streets in search of jobs uh, after the stock market crash in 1929, that was a common sight. Um, and so I'm guessing this is probably after the stock market crash. Um, and the reference to the criminal class, um, it, gangsters were notorious. And gangsters and bootleggers were that criminal class that they're likely referring to here. Um, the illicit producer, the bootlegger, and the speakeasy are reaping a rich harvest of profits and enormous revenues, estimated at from two to three billion dollars per annum, placed in the hands of the lawless and criminal elements of society through this illegal traffic are not only enabling them to carry on this business in defiance of the government, but to organize and develop other lines of criminal activity to an extent which threatens societal and economic security. Statement of Henry W. Anderson in the Wickersham Report. <clears throat> Millions of dollars are now wasted on futile attempts at enforcement when every dollar is needed to aid the unemployed. Work and vote for the repeal of the 18th Amendment. Join the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform. Three steps to temperance. Repeal the 18th Amendment and abolish national prohibition. Control the liquor traffic by a system of state regulation suitable and acceptable to the people. Educate your children to temperance in the home, the school, and the church. Work and vote for the repeal of the 18th Amendment. Join the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform. This is a group that recognized the things coming out of the ban and wanted uh, middle ground, bootleggers and organized crime, two of the biggest growth areas of national prohibition. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, we don't want to look at government forms about how to document your liquor production. We could, but also at this point I'd rather look at something slightly more interesting. Not that government forms can't be interesting. Um, this is an Ivanhoe, Virginia moonshine still glass plate. Um, I do have the glass plate. What I forgot is that if I had a glass plate, I'd probably want to light it from behind, and therefore I do not have the light box, but that's fine. I'll put a white paper behind it and we'll be fine. Um, I don't know that I will need gloves, but <clears throat> I'm putting them on just in case, because the glass plate I'd rather not touch directly. Um, hey, look, we have white paper in here already. Uh, that'll, that'll be helpful. We also have actual prints of what this plate is. I just don't know if you would put gloves on for handling, handling the plate. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I just wasn't sure if this plate will even show up without being lit from behind. Yeah, it looks like it's not going to. I may be able to light it from behind. I didn't think about bringing the light box. Uh, so give me one second. It does have a cracked edge. Um, before I get this under the camera. There. <laughs> We're gonna get this to work. Um, there. That's not bad at all. That actually worked really well. Uh, so there is the, this is the actual glass plate that you're viewing. Um, we do have prints of the same, like pho photographic print, uh, but why look at the prints? That's too easy. 
when I can light the glass plate from behind. And you can see um, this bootlegger is still from Ivanhoe, Virginia. Uh, so you can see, I don't actually know how stills work. I presume some sort of mash or other. No. OK, wait. So this piece over here, this is some sort of heating things, an oven of sorts. And then uh, stuff evaporates and condenses up here and then goes down that tube and drips into the barrel. Uh, I would love it if somebody actually knows who can tell me. Uh, because that is entirely speculation on my point, my my part. I do understand like uh, boilers with condensers and, and like that. I just don't know if that's how a moonshine stills actually function. But yeah, this is a glass plate negative. Um, please hold multitasking. Thank you for uh, assisting my wonderful mold. Um, well, we can discuss that <clears throat> as we move on. I'm, I'm going to. Uh, put the negative away. The negative, sorry, I didn't mean to flash a bright light directly at the camera there for af after I took the negative off of it. Um, but yeah, uh, so that is, that is this whole collection. This whole collection is this negative. Um, there just happened to be two prints of the photo included in here. Um, but I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so stills like that um, were for making moonshine. And moonshine um, generally, isn't moonshine generally corn-based liquor? You're trying to find some resources. A little more complicated or modern, but the science is the same. Oh wow, an entire article. Um, if you would please make sure that that one also makes it into the other chat. Um, pot still distillation. Breaking down the parts. As the liquid heats up, more volatile elements begin to vaporize and move upwards towards the neck of the still. The neck, occasionally called a swan neck due to its sometimes slightly avian appearance, may be preceded by a bulbous structure called an onion or an OG. So you've got the boiler. Uh, this would be the onion, this part up here, uh, the OG or the onion. Um, the swan neck is going to be the thing. The OG provides more surface area for vapors to interact with the copper. So this is talk, um, uh, talking about a more modern one that is a copper distiller. Um, also has the habit of causing a fraction of the vapors to condense prematurely and drop back down into the pot. This reflux reduces the amount of heavier flavor and aroma compounds in the spirit and produces a cleaner distillate. When the hot vapors get to the condenser, they meet uh, cool copper coils or tubes. The condenser is cooled by a, a coolant, usually water, that enters the condenser from the bottom and picks up the heat. But yeah, so essentially it, it, it'll run down that tube and into the barrel. Barrel stills are a version of the pot still, you think. You know they're different from a column still. Still. Uh, you are the most knowledgeable person here, so. 
Fun fact, pot stills do not have to be made of copper, but it is traditional. <clears throat> this one is kind of cool. Um, oh. I put the photos inside the box, but they weren't inside the box originally. So I will take them back out. Um, let's see. I've got some more. I've got a few more things. Um, there was another. Where did it go? Ah. I was like, there was one thing that I definitely wanted to get to today for me. Like, I was excited to look at it. Um, here it is. This is an accession, a relatively new one. We got this this year, uh, and it'll be added to our cocktail ephemera collection. Um, and when Kira told me about it, I was like, this needs to be on stream. Uh, I mean, this first one, not really in terribly interesting. It's just advertising bottles. Uh, this, however. So this one is, um, it's on the list of items. This is the collection of Southern Wine and Liquor Company Ephemera. Uh, and I will zoom in, because this smaller item, we can definitely go for a bit of a closer zoom. We may even be able to go one more. Ha, huh, we can. Virginia goes dry November 1st, but we will continue our shipping mail order business from Bristol, Tennessee. You may continue to use any of our printed return envelopes. They are all good and your orders will be handled as quickly as heretofore by the promptest shipper, shippers, the Southern Wine and Liquor Company, Bristol, Virginia, Tennessee. Um, so Bristol is a city that exists partly in Virginia and partly in Tennessee. Um, and so Virginia in implemented prohibition before Tennessee did. And so this was a business um, letting people on the Tennessee side of the border in Bristol know that they could still rely upon them to get alcohol, uh, even though the people on the Virginia side of the border would no longer be able to buy alcohol from them. And I think that that is a really interesting communication. I think it's, this is, I just found this to be a really interesting item because of that. Uh, and so wanted to make sure I shared it. Um, a wonderful little pink envelope with it. Um, and an ad on the back for Old Forester. 40 years on the market and quality never questioned. Uh, uh, that can give us a date, although I assume the date, I mean, Virginia, we, we could look up when Virginia um, instituted prohibition and when it went into effect. But also, we could date this by when was Old Forester 40 years old? Uh, then we have an order form, Cream of Kentucky V Whiskey, um, price list. So most of this is just normal, like cocktail ephemera stuff. We could look up prices for alcohols and things like that. Um, a letter to the customers. To our customers, you all know that Virginia goes dry November 1st, but we will be able to handle your orders after that date at Bristol, Tennessee. We have made arrangements to continue our mail order business from that place, and your orders will go forward just as promptly as before. We hope you will favor us with as many orders as possible before November 1st. Don't wait until the last week! 
When the law goes into effect in the state of Virginia, any shipments over one quart that remain undelivered cannot be received by any customer in that state. The express agents will be compelled to return them to the shippers. Get your orders to us in time so that the express company will be able to forward them to you early and avoid the rush at the last minute. Do not take any chance of not getting your package. Continue to use our printed return envelopes. We will get them and forward your orders from Bristol, Tennessee after November 1st. Our customers in other states, such as South Carolina, Kentucky, etc., will get the same service from us as in the past and can now order the amount allowed by law in each state. Their orders will be handled by us without any interruption, so send them along as usual. We will be the nearest shippers to South Carolina after November 1st, so hope you will favor us with all of your business and we promise prompt shipment and satisfaction. Yours truly, the Southern Wine and Liquor Company, Promptest Shippers. <clears throat> November 1st, 1916. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is actually an excellent document for like the history of Prohibition. Because um, as of November 1st, 1916, Bristol, Tennessee was the closest place to order liquor if you lived in South Carolina. And South Carolina is not really close to Bristol, Tennessee. So that was interesting. Let's see, uh, what else do we have? What else do we have? Um, we're a little over time. Uh, and Kira, if you have recommendations of anything that I should share from the um, list that I compiled, let me know. If there's something that would be like, ooh, this would be really, really nice to look at. Maybe show that before we end. Uh, Manual of the Champion, the Anti-Prohibition Manual. The Temperance Folly. <clears throat> the Anti-Prohibition Manual, the Summary of Facts and Figures Dealing with Prohibition. Library Edition, 1918. Do you know that the production and distribution of alcoholic beverages give employment directly to 1,100,000 persons? That if those indirectly affected are included, the number employed would reach 1,600,000, representing a population of 8 million? That the trades affected are not only the distillery and brewery, wor brewery workers, but countless other allied industries such as bottle makers, carpenters, coopers, cork dealers, uh, fixture manufacturers, lithographers, printers, etc. That the liquor industry employs people at wages superior to all but a few industries in the country. That those employed by the liquor industry would, under prohibition, be compelled to hunt for other lines of work, with the ultimate result that the standard of living for all working men must become lower? That wage is a commodity subject to the law of supply and demand? That prohibition would strike the blow that would affect the jobs of 1,600,000 workers and jeopardize the livelihood of all those dependent upon them? Think it over. Oh, wow. And 16-Bit and Eric has joined us again. Uh, welcome, 16-Bit Eric. Welcome, Whimsies. Um, I hope you all had fun uh, playing Pokemon Shield. Um, Today on Archival Adventures, we are looking at materials about prohibition and temperance. Um, I, have, I have had a fun time uh, reading out some sermons on temperance from uh, speakers in the country. We just looked at a um, few of 
few minutes ago, we just looked at uh, some information from a liquor sales place in Bristol, Tennessee, talking about Virginia was about to institute prohibition and um, Bristol uh, straddles the border between Virginia and Tennessee. And uh, they were letting their customers know that they would still be able to serve them on the Tennessee side of that border um, because Virginia implemented prohibition before national prohibition took effect. Uh, but yeah, welcome in everybody. It's great to see you. Um, I hope that you are having a good week. Uh, if anybody who was here is not following 16-Bit Eric, you should definitely follow 16-Bit Eric. Um, he is a wonderful streamer and a definite friend of this show because um, raids fairly regularly. Um, so we've, we've looked at a number of sources that were pro-prohibition and we've been just looking at some of the um, anti-prohibition sources. The Temperance Folly, or Who's the Worst, by Lois Weisbrooker. To the wrecks and the so-called sinners of a false civilization, these pages are lovingly dedicated by the author. Price, 10 cents. I'm assuming the Temperance Folly uh, will be something arguing against temperance. It would be laughable were it not so pitiable to witness the ignorance of those who attempt to reform the world by dealing with effects instead of the causes which produce them. Uh, did we see a date on this? We do not have a date for this. Oh, 1900. Ahem. <clears throat> They keep working right along in the same old channel and never seem to suspect that they are making things worse all the time. And there is no so-called reform of which this is more true than of the temperance crusade. After all these years of effort, after all the temperance societies, after all the temperance lectures, all the laws that have been enacted for the regulation or the suppression of the traffic, after the raiding of the saloons by women, after all the preaching, praying, denunciation, and ostracism, after all the books that have been written and all the other efforts that have been made, the conditions are now worse than before a single thing had been done toward the suppression of this evil. For it is an evil, and a very great one, and I charge the worst features of the traffic as it exists today to the temperance agitator. So apparently not in favor of drinking, still anti-drinking, they just think that the people who were fighting to stop drink, uh, stop, the people who were fighting to make alcohol not available in the US were doing it wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> Interesting. <clears throat> but we've had plenty of arguments as to why alcohol bad. Uh, so I, I really was hoping to find more sources that were like, hey, we work in this area. We actually make alcohol and we sell it and not always bad. Uh, so I was trying to find that counter argument. Um, there are a couple of photos, I think. I'm going to... Eh. Let's see. Um... Box one. Folder seven. I don't know. Folder 11, cabins. No? I don't know which of these are gonna be really good or not. Uh, I think I'm going to go for the ones that actually show moonshiners. Which I suppose would have been bootleggers? Are moonshiners and bootleggers the same thing? If you know, please let me. Because I don't know. Uh, let's see. Box 2. Folder 7. 
Yeah, let's go there. Because <clears throat> we have uh, Lincoln Cockrum, who is a moonshiner. Uh, this is a photograph collection. So I'm putting on my gloves uh, because if they're glossy photographs, I don't want to get my skin oils on them. It looks like they're all encased in mylar and that I would not need the, the gloves to handle these. Um, hi, Sanoman5000. Uh, my understanding is moonshiners make it bootleggers transport it by hiding it in their boots. Excellent. Thank you for the clarification. Um, so there are a couple of photos in here. The one we're looking for is Lincoln Cockrum, uh, who is not this. This, this is not Lincoln. Um, but let's see. I haven't done an entire stream on this photo collection. I probably should at some point. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm trying to find some of the contextualizing information and see what I can learn. Ah, here we go. It's the last photo in the folder. That's the one that we're looking for. So, um, of course, now that I have taken my glove off, oh, never mind. It, we will read the caption first and then we'll look at the photo because the caption is taped to the back. Meet. Lincoln Bushrod Cockrum, who lives on Raven's Den Creek. The lines of the face of this rough and ready mountaineer speak indelibly of his Anglo-Saxon heritage. He was the undisputed king of a covey of moonshiners along the creek. The brandy he turned out from a 200-gallon solid copper outfit was, would scorch the hair on a feller's throat. Um... I don't know the dates on these photos. I'm going to use my own resource and pull up the finding aid for the Earl Palmer, Earl Palmer Appalachian Photograph Collection. Because um, I want a date range here. The photos were taken sometime between the 1940s and the 1970s. Uh, so this is all post-prohibition, uh, but here is a moonshiner. This is what a moonshiner in Appalachia looked like sometime between the 40s and the 70s. If I go to folder 12, we've also got Ted DeHart, uh, who's also supposed to be a moonshiner. What did I say, folder 12? Yeah. This is me reminding myself what I said. Folder 12. I'm looking for Ted DeHart. He is not listed on the cover of this folder. I wonder if I wrote down the wrong number. Well, that's a bummer. 
I'll look inside the folder anyway, but I probably wrote down the wrong number. Some interesting characters here. I wish I knew who they were. I probably would know if I, if I look at the back of the photos, it'll probably tell me, but then I have to take them out of the sleeves to do that. Come on. The complex operation that is attempting to see the back side of these photos. Right, so that is Thomas Jefferson Cap. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, go wrap things up. Yes, thank you for the, the time reminder. Thank you, Elixir. Yeah, we'll have to wrap up soon because um, I'll have to put all this stuff away and then go home. But I was looking to see if I could find another moonshiner to show you all. Um, or more pictures of a still, but it does not seem like that is going to happen with this folder. So that's fine. Uh, <laughs> As always, we don't manage to get to nearly everything that I pulled for this stream. Uh, there's always more. There's always the chance that we could revisit a topic. Um, I think that we're definitely going to have to do a stream on this Earl Palmer photographs and artifacts collection at some point because there's some really nice photos in there. Um, there is one last item. I think. Box seven, folder one. There are no folders in here. It's a lot of old cameras. <laughs> I am striking out here at the end. I was trying to share some really cool stuff. Uh, and I'm just striking out. Regardless, uh, box seven folder one was trying to direct me to oversized photos because there was supposed to be in the oversized photos moonshine and moonshiners. Um, I'm guessing mountain cabin home, no mention of moonshine there. Cabin homes. Here we go. Here we are. Let's see what it says. No description, but that is definitely some people making some moonshine. do have descriptive text for the next one. Uh, um. Meet Ted Thumpkeg DeHart, Sinking Creek, Virginia. Thumpkeg knows what he wants out of life. Uh, knows what he wants out of life, he does. Following in the boot prints of his father and granddad, he runs, runs a, little a, a little liquor to keep the wolf from his door and corn pone and beans on his table to feed his brood of always hungry young'uns. You can't fault a feller for looking out for his own, 
thump keg explodes one day when I visited him at his hideaway under the friendly shelter of a laurel thicket hemming in Runnet Bag Creek. Squinting at the steaming pot of his still, he added, Who this side of hell will feed and clothe my family if I don't? And he slammed a boot against a mash barrel to drive his words home. Um... We have one more photo of, uh, there he is, working with his still and filling up those glass bottles with some moonshine. So when liquor became illegal in the U.S., people, especially in Appalachia, uh, people started making liquor at home, distilling their own spirits and then running it into town. Uh, and selling it. Um, it's a part of the culture in Appalachia that moonshine is still um, available. There are some really, really nice, like, luxury brand moonshines now. Um, I am aware of the time, Philip. Thank you. <laughs> yep, we are gonna we are gonna close down. Um, Sadly, I can't just sit here and look at materials all day. But I do want to say thank you to everybody who joined. And um, there will not be an Arkle Adventures next week. Uh, I, because next week, at the time where I am normally streaming, I will be teaching a class. Uh, so I have um, a class of graduate students coming in. Uh, and I will be doing an introduction to them focused on um, how they can access materials in our collections and specifically the history of higher education in the United States. So um, I will see you again in two weeks. Uh, and in two weeks time, the stream will focus on the architectural collection of L uh, Lillian Gramatikova. Um, so that is the upcoming plan for Archival Adventures. I do want to thank you very much for joining me today. Let me see who we're going to pop on over to uh, for a raid. I think today we're going to pop on over to the aquarium. Uh, so it does appear to be jellyfish cam day. Um, but yeah, we're going to pop over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, and say hello over there. Um, as always, thank you for joining me. I hope I see you again soon. Uh, and that until I do, you continue to enjoy exploring history.